that all this agrees exactly with every phenomenon that everybody has ever observed with light, every detailed phenomenon. So I'm just going to start with the simplest possible ones that are common. All right? We start with a mirror. We start with the problem of determining how light is reflected from a mirror. And we have a, here a source of light, and here the photoelectric cell, which is, go I mean, a photomultiplier uh, that's going to measure very low intensity light. We have one photon at a time go here through here, and we would like to know what the chance is that this thing gives a count. It's also possible that the light goes straight across. To avoid that, we put a black bo box in here. So we have to think, and we would expect that what we'd have is that the light would reflect from the mirror like so, and that's what we usually say, and that all you need is this piece in the mirror here, and it's got nothing to do with the price of cheese under these circumstances, right? And that, in fact, the place where it reflects is where the angles are equal. That might be obvious to you because it's so darn symmetrical, but if I put this thing further down, you can still prove the angles are equal, and I'll show why it is. By this rule? Yes, sir. As follows. Rule. Probability that a thing occurs is a square of an amplitude. Amplitude is the sum of amplitude for every way that the thing can happen. In that experiment, there were two ways it could happen. In this experiment, there's virtually an infinite number of ways it can happen. To make it easier to understand, suppose that this mirror surface was temporarily divided into little squares. It's best if the mind forgets for a while that there's another dimension to this mirror this way. This is a cross-section of the mirror. And just for the hell of it, I can forget that, but we can do it the other way, too. Now, what happens is that there's several ways in which the photon could have gone to the photomultiplier. It could have come down to this part of the mirror and bounced off and went to here. You're crazy. The angle ain't equal. I'm not crazy. That's what happened. <laughs> Another possibility is it could come here and go, or it could come here and go, or it could come uh, where you'd like it to come and go, <laughs> and it can go over here and go, and so on, and so on. And these are all possibilities. And the idea is that there's a certain amplitude that it does it this way, an amplitude that it does it that way, and so on. And now we have to figure out the total probability that it does it at all. Naturally, instinctively, you're gonna, you know, I'm going to tell you the rule that the amplitude is biggest for the one where the angles are equal. No, no. The amplitudes are, they're slight variations. which We're not going to worry about them. It's almost the same for this one as for that one. Let us take it easy. We make approximations here to make it easy to do, and I don't want to absolutely exactly mathematic. I just want to explain the idea. I'm going to suppose it's exactly the same amplitude for every one of these things. But the timing eh, is different. That is, let's suppose that the rule of ref that your chance that you get reflect the amplitude to be reflected in a in a little square here, this some little arrow. Very small, I draw it. But because it, I have to count the total time to go from here to here to here, this arrow, the contribution of this one, gets rotated, zing, depends upon this time. And the one that goes from here to here is also rotated, but not by the same amount. Because I think you can almost see that the distance from here to here is certainly not the same as the total distance from there to there. There's a time it would take. You don't. It's not obvious? All right, then let's take a place way over here. The time it would take to go over here and then go rushing off to here is certainly longer than it would take to go the easy way. And in fact, if you were in a hurry and you had to run over to this wall and run back, you'd know more or less that the best way to do it is somewhere in the middle there. <laughs> and it isn't a good idea to run to the wall here and then have to go back. <laughs> so what we're going to do here is to figure this out by a series of drawings to help us calculate. The second drawing underneath here is a kind of a graph. I, let's see if I can do this with colors by some. I don't know how to do it with colors. I didn't figure it out ahead of time. But this is a graph in which I measure this way. Yeah, let's do it this way. The time that it would take to go from here to the mirror and over here, and I'm plotting it this way, directly under the place where I wanted to go in the mirror. See? Now, the time it takes to go here, we just found out, was pretty large, and getting going down, more or less, as we got near the center, and of course, it's a kind of a symmetric curve, and it goes up here. What do I mean by this? Is this, at this, at this, let's make it very definite. If you're going to reflect from this point here, this particular route, 
then this is the amount of time. This height is a graph of the amount of time. There's a lot of time. If, on the other hand, colors, colors. If, on the other hand, you were to go somewhere near the middle and come down this way and go so, then the time it would take is less. And it's plotted on this scale as this height from here to here. You don't have to worry about the plot if you understand the idea. The time is big, comes down, and goes back up again. That's all, depending on where you are. And now what does that mean for our arrows? It means this, that the contribution from this one corresponds to an arrow like this, a little baby arrow. Baby because I made these things very tiny in the end. Uh, I told you in the last lecture that we have learned that students take four years of undergraduate work plus four years of graduate work to learn how to add these arrows cleverly and quickly. And we'll just do some simple examples. So I tell you what, we, we'll have to just work it out ourselves for one or two examples. But that's all they learn is how to add the arrow. Now this, <laughs> what you do here is you take this arrow and you turn it around a lot, a lot. That's I call a lot from here to here. And you come out with the arrow in some direction because it's spun around and spun around at so much time. Now on the next point here, which I didn't draw in a color, but just let's talk about it, is less time. It doesn't turn around as much. It's more like that, okay? The next one is less time. It doesn't turn around as much. I should be coming toward the green one in case. In this term, it's not, well, let's say, let's say this one's around here. And this one, you see, what I want to point out that the, well, I didn't do it too well, but that the change is less each time as I go along. That this one is, I don't mean it that, it's an accident that it comes out nearly horizontal. I don't care where it came out, but unfortunately it's nearly horizontal. Let's say that the next one is hardly any change from this and corresponds perhaps to that direction. There's no meaning to the absolute fact that it happened to come out that way. But it's important to point out that as I go on to the other side, the timing is increasing again, and so the contribution, the arrow I would have to draw to correspond to the contribution from this would be again slightly inclined. As I went further over, the inclination would increase again further and further. If I do it very carefully, I should have at corresponding places out this side the same kind of arrows as on this side. In other words, the contribution that's made according to this dopey rule that to get the total amplitude that the thing arrives over there, whose square is the probability. We have to add an amplitude for each root, and each amplitude is the same, except that turns different degrees depending on the time. And now I have to add all these things together. Of course, it goes on and on on both sides in the mirror way out, and it's hard to get started because they're way over here. But let me just start over here or further back. What happens is I'm going to put the arrows on each other's tail. This one represents the first one here, and now this one comes. You see, I put the arrows on each other's tail. And then the next one, it isn't working out too <laughs> It's hard to make the drawing clear, but maybe you'll believe me when I tell you what happens if you do it very carefully. And then it comes an arrow this way. And then the green one, which is hardly any difference in direction. And then the next pink one, that is just tilted up there a little bit again. And then tilted up some more and then tilt it up some more, and then tilt it way back. And now let's, for the fun of it, keep on going. Yeah? But what will happen to the things that get turned more and more and turned more and more? So the next one's this way, and 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 the next one's this way. Okay, boom. <laughs> and in the same way, the stuff that I hadn't drawn yet over there correspond to an arrow tilted still further cockeyed and still further cockeyed into so on, all knotted up and more things. Now that from one edge of the mirror, which is the last, the 74th arrow over there that I know, to the other edge of the mirror, which is a seven millionth actually arrow, because it's a, usually with a reasonably sized mirror, since these angles involve turns, involve millionths of an inch, there are millions of turns. So that this got down to really down in the middle here, and it goes to the middle here. And so that the total amplitude, which is the sum of all these arrows added together, of which last time I added two, I now add three, no, I add five, no, I add millions of them. I get a line for the net result of the whole thing, the total amplitude to arrive, which is this tremendous line from here to here, the result of all those little arrows. 
Okay? Now, let's investigate. What determines how long that line is? That, the size of that square determines the probability. Now we notice a number of things. First, that the edges of the mirror are not important. That were I to have chopped a piece of the mirror off over here, a piece that you had intuition knows I was wasting my time piddling around with, it wouldn't make any difference. Because that part in there, the arrows are going... <laughs> I throw it all away. I don't, it doesn't make any difference because... So I start a little bit off here, a shade. It doesn't hardly make any difference. Therefore, I can really chop this mirror down a bit. Where is the part of the mirror that makes the real difference, that makes this get a real length, that makes it likely to be big? It's the place where the arrows are all pointing nearly in the same direction for a while. Think a while. It means it's the place where the curve stops changing for a while. And after much mental effort, you'll discover that's always the place where the time is least, or possibly of the way sometimes, most. Most often in practice, it's least, but it can happen most. Any time the time curve stops changing, it's a place where the time is least. And so it turns out that the ray that's most important, the thing that determines the probability, is the part of the physical world which is close to the place where the time is least. And that's why you don't have to worry about the other part of the mirror. And that's why, crudely speaking, you say, hell with the rest of the mirror, I can just use a little piece. You're wrong if the piece gets too short. If it gets too short, you don't get much of these. You get a few of them and not enough. You get different answers. But that's a few, maybe thousandths of an inch, and you're not used to experiments with thousandths of an inch mirrors, although in the laboratory we have many such experiments, and I would am strongly tempted to tell you what happens with such things and so on, but that's not everybody's experience, and so I have to stop myself somewhere. And so I stop here. I say, what I've done is I've pointed out that only part that really counts to give you the answer there is what happens in the center of the mirror, that the other parts cancel themselves out in their effects. They're just as strong, they're just as big an arrow from here as there was from here. But you just move a little shade over and there's another big one trying to undo it because it's twisted. And uh, in the middle where the time is least, uh, the arrows for a while point in the same direction. That's why, in approximation, we say you can get away with a crude picture of the world by saying the light just comes to the middle part where the time is least. And it's mathematically easy to prove that in any circumstance when the time is least, it turns out it means those angles are equal. And I, again, I attempted to prove that, but I won't bother you in straining your geometric imagination. No, it perhaps bothers you a little bit to have to say that the reflection, that all this is happening, that there's reflections from all this part of the mirror when all it does is cancel out. And so, uh, let's discuss this a little bit. Let's do an experiment to find out how much light is reflected under similar circumstances. And I guess uh, since I have one more color and I don't want to erase everything I've got there, uh, let us just imagine for definiteness that uh, only this well, here, let's say this piece of the mirror. I just used a piece of mirror so big. No bigger. I just used a little piece. Of, it's a big piece. But it's in the wrong place. And I expect to see the light reflected from here to there. Not very likely, yeah? Mm. But this dopey physics says that, yes, you have to calculate all the arrows from all this stuff from here to here. And they're all changing. It corresponds to the arrows up to there from the beginning. So it's just a bunch of arrows that go zzz, zzz, zzz for a while, and I stop, okay? You know, that line means that these arrows are not in the picture anymore because that part of the mirror isn't there. And so you see that the distance from where I started to where I finished is very small. Not zero, but very small. And it's true. Uh, experimentally, with a finite piece of mirror, you get a tiny amount of light reflected in an odd manner. It's called diffraction from the edges, but I don't want to go into that. It's very tiny, so let's say it's zero. This idea that the whole